going to get right get right into it since uh, this is a long, long, uh, long lecture. It'll take us through today and the next class. So we'll just get going on chapter nine. Today we're learning about budgeting. And um, of course, there are learning objectives to go over, such as explaining why organizations budget, describing the process that they use to create budgets. Um, prepare the sporting components of a master budget and the budget financial statements, prepare a flexible budget, and explain the need for the flexible budget approach, prepare a performance report using the flexible budget approach. And we'll look at uh, Appendix 9A on Thursday, if we have time, to look at how to compute inventory level and order size. So a budget is uh, a detailed quantitative plan. So of course it uses figures and numbers and um, it's used for acquiring and using financial resources and other resources over a specified time period that is forthcoming. So we budget for the future, right? We don't budget for the past that's already happened. Um, the act of preparing the budget itself is called budgeting and it's a process uh, that every organization or every organization uses to some extent um, and the use of budgets to control an organization's activity is known as budgetary control we'll talk about the master budget that summarizes a company's plans uh, setting specific targets for sales production distribution administrative and financing activities and so why do organizations create budgets? Um, that's a good question. The basics, I would say the most basic answer is as a planning tool and to have a plan and some direction, right? Think of it like a, a bit of a roadmap. If you're going on a trip, you at least need to know where you're starting, where you're going, and then what possible routes you can take to get there. So that's essentially what budgeting is as well. Uh, a lot of organizations don't do it, <laughs> unfortunately, even businesses. Um, a lot of people just kind of do it on the fly, but that's not a good way to do it. Uh, it's not very productive and you can run into a lot of problems. So organizations will undertake planning that uh, involves developing objectives and preparing various budgets to achieve those objectives. Control uh, in terms of budgeting is what involves gathering feedback so that we can assess the extent to which the objectives developed at the planning stage and the budgeting stage are being attained and an effective budgeting system it'll provide for both planning and control so we use budgets to do things like encourage managers to think about and plan for the future to communicate management's financial goals throughout the organization uh, to allocate resources to those parts of the organization where they can be used most effectively or to coordinate the plans and activities of managers in different departments. So budgets are part of a control system and budgets are compared to actual results during the year. So we'll look at you know what our budget was for say a quarter or the past month and look at our actual results and then compare the two and we do this to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our operations also to evaluate and reward employees um, you know based on how they performed according to budgets and plans now in terms of choosing a budget period uh 12 months is very common you'll often see a continuous budget that is a 12 but budget that rolls forward one month or quarter as the current month or quarter is completed. So it's a constant, basic 12 month budget, right? You always update, say the next month or the next quarter as one period passes. Um, that's not the only way to do it, obviously, but uh, a lot of organizations do do it like that. A lot of organizations just do it on an annual basis, right? So they have a budgeting process and that's part of the budget period too. So you can also, of course, break up your annual operating budget. You can divide it into quarterly budgets or monthly budgets. It can be very useful as well, depending on your situation. Generally, companies will create budgets by relying on a combination of top-down budgeting and participative budgeting. And participative budgets 
involve managers from across an organization in developing budget estimates for their areas of responsibility. So uh, some of you might have done this um, in some of your, your work experience already. Uh, if you work in administration um, in a kind of middle level to management level, it's very common to be involved in these budgeting processes. And um, basically what happens in a participated budget is finance people get together with the appropriate managers from a given department and they work together to develop estimates for the budget based on the input of the managers from these departments and the um, assistance of the finance people. There's also what's called the top-down approach where top level managers just initiate the budgeting process by issuing overall profit targets. Uh, and that's pretty common too. I guess, you know, it depends a lot on the organization and what its goals are and how it operates, uh, how big it is, all kinds of different things. Um, I think I mentioned that uh, participative budgeting is fairly common. A lot of organizations and companies use it because involving those managers who are below a senior level in developing budgets, you know, it shows respect for their experience and opinions uh, by including them in the process and considering their expertise and opinions. And it also leverages their knowledge and experience to provide more accurate estimates. So, uh, you know, generally the managers in various departments are going to have a really good idea of how everything works together and what affects budgeting forecasts and what affects costs and profits, et cetera. So they can contribute a lot to generating more accurate estimates. Um, it can increase their motivation to achieve goals that they had some input in setting and establishing, and it can empower them to take ownership of the budget and to be accountable for deviations from the budget. Budgetary slack is something you'll hear about, uh, at least in, in this course and in management accounting. Um, budget estimates that are prepared by lower level managers cannot simply be accepted without review by higher levels of management. And that's the process you'll see in most organizations, as long as they're functioning relatively well. So they have to be reviewed. So you put a review system in place because if you don't have a review system in place, then participative budgets may contain excessive budgetary slack. And what slack is, is the difference between the revenues and expenses, expenses that a manager expects can be achieved and the amounts included in the budget. So often in budgets, you'll see this slack, right? So that it gives uh, people in different departments the opportunity to have some wiggle room, as they say, uh, some that fudge factor room. That's basically what slack is. You also um, see that benchmarking is uh, becoming more and more common and it's very useful practice. Um, and benchmarking is the process of some companies using the performance of competitors, such as best in class companies or other business units in the same company to set these benchmarks, which are goals to achieve and to uh, assess yourself against. A best in class company is one that is known for achieving exceptional levels of performance on some aspect of their operations. It could be customer service, it could be distribution, it could be a certain production um, method or system, marketing, et cetera. And so when we compare revenue costs or process performance to other high performing companies or to other successful business units in the same company, that is what we call benchmarking. So there are a number of behavioral factors in budgeting as well. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's just looked at as something you have to do. I know in a lot of the organizations I've been in, a lot of people hate budgeting. Um, essentially, people who don't like numbers, right? And there are a lot of reasons for that. But, um, you know, two big important purposes of budgets are to motivate people and then coordinate efforts both amongst people and then amongst different departments, if the need be. And, you know, these efforts and these purposes, they can certainly be undermined 
if the budget being used is done so in an inflexible manner and it's being used to control people, that's not why we want budgets, right? We want budgets to set targets and motivate people, provide some incentives and some goals to strive for and provide feedback throughout the process, that sort of thing and support. But um, so we have this idea of responsibility accounting where managers are held responsible for those items and only those items that they can actually influence to a significant extent. Uh, so that's an important thing in budgeting too, is to be sure <laughs> that if you're a senior manager or you're an employee who's involved in the budgeting process and assessing budgets and performance, that you really have to clearly identify what can actually be influenced by managers and staff in your company. Another key issue is the motivational aspect of budgets. Um, with respect to the motivational aspect is the difficulty level of the budget targets for revenues and expenses. So if the bu budgets are too difficult to attain, um, employees are going to realize that they are unattainable and motivation and morale will most likely suffer. So if you have, you know, targets and budgets that are just too difficult, you haven't attained them before, you haven't put in the changes in the processes to achieve those difficult targets, uh, employees are going to catch on to that right away, right? Uh, most employees know their job. Um, they know how things work in their area, in their particular department, and they're going to look at these unattainable budgets, say, forget it, like, what's the point, you know, we're just going to work our butt off for something that can't be achieved, and then end up getting um, negative feedback for not achieving it. And then on the flip side, if the budgets are too easy, then you'll have inefficiencies or less effort, right? If you have too much of that wiggle room, that quote unquote wiggle room to play with, then there really isn't any incentive to address inefficiencies when you have all this, this fudge factor space basically in your budgeting process. So they can't be too easy and they can't be too difficult. You really have to find that optimum, optimum balance. Um, the master budget uh, it contains everything, right? So it contains the sales budget. Um, this can be a little bit difficult to follow this graphic, so I'll do the best, right? The sales budget we use to determine our production budget based on what our ending inventory budget is. Uh, then from there, we can budget for things like direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. We have to budget for cash, as in when cash is coming in, when it's going out. Um, and that's actually very easy to do once you learn the process. And we'll have budgeted balance sheets and budgeted income statements. Uh, so the master budget contains all of these elements. And then we're going to have these kind of sub budgets for production, sales, administration, et cetera. The sales budget is a detailed schedule that's showing the expected sales for the budgeting period and typically it'll be expressed in dollar terms and in units of product as well and having an accurate sales budget when uh, for a for-profit organization is a is key to the entire budgeting process and all of the other parts of this master budget that we just briefly touched on really depend on the sales budget in some way as you see if you look back here right it really does start with the sales budget if you're in a for-profit company so these master budgets that we're learning about um, master budget for a manufacturing company will be designed to answer 10 key questions uh, and those questions are how much sales will we earn how much cash will we collect from customers how much raw material will we need to purchase? How much manufacturing, manufacturing cost will we incur? How much cash will we pay to our suppliers and our direct laborers? And how much will we pay for manufacturing overhead resources? What is the total cost that will be transferred from finished goods inventory to cost of goods sold? How much selling and administrative expense will we incur? incur and how much cash will we pay related to those expenses? And how much money will we borrow from from our lenders or repay to our lenders, including interest, how much operating income will we earn? And what will our balance sheet look like at the end of the budgeting period? It seems like a lot, but once you learn it step by step, it's actually quite straightforward and easy to do. So we're going to go through a big example. Um, 
and it's for Royal Company. They're preparing budgets for the quarter ending June 30th. They have budgeted sales for April to August in so many thousands of units per month. And the selling price is $10 per unit. So for the sales budget, in this case, the individual months of April, May, and June are summed up to obtain the total projected sales in units and dollars for the quarter ending June 30th, right? And so it's based on 20,000, 50,000, 30,000 units for each of those months at $10 per unit in terms of revenue. So these are budgeted sales for the first quarter based on the information we've been given month by month and for the quarter. We can then do some cash budgeting, um, which is very important. And it's easy for some people to miss this. I've done a lot of budgets over the years um, and it's an important part, right? It's considering the cash aspect when cash comes in. So they're doing this right here with Royal expects, or Royal has established that the collection pattern with all sales being on account, they receive 70% of sales in the month sale, then 25% are collected in the following month, and then 5% are uncollectible. And we are given that at March 31st, the accounts receivable balance of 30,000 will be collected in full. So for our cash collections budget, we start off with that $30,000 receivables at the end of March, that's gonna be collected in full in April. Then we see going forward though, for April, we have some different stipulations, right? 70% of our sales, which are all on account, 70% of our sales are going to be collected in the month of April. Then 25% will be collected the following month in May. And then 5% we are budgeting is uncollectible. In May, it's the same thing, right? You're going to have 70% of your sales for May collected in that month then 25% of your sales for May collected in June. And based on the information we've seen here, what will the total collections be for the quarter? Well, we haven't gone through them all, right? We, or we did actually, right? So it's just the sum of these various collections and it happens to be $905,000. Which you see, right? It's just, we quickly calculated the cash collections for each month of the quarter, then sum them up. The production budget um, is something that anytime you're producing with things, whether it's you know an actual manufacturing position, um, uh, manufacturing operation, obviously a production budget is going to be very important, but you can use it for um, other types of operations, you know, creating things, right? If uh, web design for instance you could do a production budget based on how many websites you think you can do in a year based on the sales you're projecting so uh, the quick point there is that it doesn't just apply to you know manufacturing widgets and automobiles and things that we hold in our hands okay so the production budget has to be adequate to meet the budgeted sales and provide for sufficient ending inventory at the end of the particular budgeting period Royal Company wants ending inventory to be equal to 20% of the following month's budgeted sales and units. So on March 31st, we had 4,000 units on hand. And from there, we can prepare a production budget knowing what our sales projections were uh, for the three months in the quarter, right? We budgeted sales 20,000 units, 50,000 units, and 30,000 units for April, May, and June. Our desired ending inventory in April is 10,000. So we need 30,000 units for all of April, less the beginning inventory of 4,000 that was carried over for March. So that's how we determine what our required production is for April. And that's just like we noted in the previous slide, desired and ending inventory is based on 20% of the budget sales for the coming month. So 20% of 50,000 in May gives you that 10,000 units desired inventory. We were told that we had 4,000 units at the end of March. So what is the required production for May? 
we'll just go through, look through how they quickly calculate. It's 46,000 units, but to get there, we take the 50,000 budgeted sales, 20% of what we're budgeting for sales in June to get the desired ending inventory of 6,000 units, right? Then we get our total needs. We had our beginning inventory from April of 10,000. So that's how we come up with our required production for May of 46,000. And June follows the same process. And we're assuming the ending inventory for June though, because we haven't budgeted for July. But that's essentially how you do a production budget. It's just a series, really a series of small steps. Um, and, you know, one mistake can mess the whole thing up. So you do have to be fairly diligent. From the production budget, we can then do our direct materials budget, um, right? Because we need to know what the production is to um, know what we're going to need for materials. So once we've determined what production has to be for every given month, then we can provide, uh, then we can determine raw materials and direct materials. And for Royal Company, there are five pounds of material required for every unit of product. Management wants materials on hand at the end of each month equal to 10% of the following month's production. So then they don't have to wait to start production, right? In the next month, they'll have some on hand. On March 31st, 13,000 pounds of material are on hand and material cost is 40 cents per pound. So now we can prepare the direct materials budget with this information. We know what our production figures are because we just did our production budget. So that's where the production figures for April, May, June and the quarter are coming from. We're given five pounds of material per unit. So we need 130,000 pounds of material in April to produce what we're producing in April, 230,000 pounds in May and 145,000 pounds in June. That's just for what's being produced. Then we determine what our um, total pounds needed are based on what our production needs are, our desired ending inventory at the end of April. And then we can determine what our materials to be purchased are for the year or for the month based on what our beginning inventory was as well. We had 13,000 pounds of material at the end of March and we need to purchase 140,000 pounds in April. And part of that is so, right, we have this beginning material on hand in May, as we'll see, 10% of the production needs for May we want to have on hand at the end of April. So how much material should be purchased in May? 221,500 pounds. And that's just based on using the same process that we did for April, right? We know that our ending inventory is based on June's um, production. And we know what our production is for May. We know what our beginning inventory is. And we do the simple addition and subtraction to get to that 221,500 for materials to be purchased in May. In June, again, we're assuming an ending inventory of 11,500 because we don't actually know what July's uh, sales estimates are and production estimates are, but we can go through and do that for June and determine what, how much we need to purchase the materials. And these are in, in pounds we're working with right now. And then from there, we can determine the cash requirements. So Royal pays 40 cents per pound for its materials. One half of a month's purchases is paid for in the month of purchase and the other half is paid in the following month. So it's a 50-50 split. March 31st accounts payable balance is 12,000. And so with that, we can start calculating our cash disbursements. So we start off in April with our accounts payable balance. We are going to be paying 50% of April's purchases in April and 50% in May. And these cash amounts, these dollar amounts are based on, again, 40 cents per pound and 140,000 pounds being needed 
in April. And we'll just do the same thing for, we'll just do the same thing for the other two months too, as you'll see, carry that through. What are the total cash disbursements for the quarter? We'll walk through them. It's 185,000. And how we get there is just based on what we know uh, for materials we're going to be paying, right? 50% of the materials purchased are paid in the month we purchase them and the other 50% the following month. And that's basically how we're determining what our cash disbursements are for materials. So again, just a number of small steps. Then we can move on to the direct labor budget. Uh, and that's a detailed plan that we put together showing labor requirements for a specific time period. In Royal's case, each unit of product requires 0 0.05 hours of direct labor, which works out to three minutes. The company has a no layoff policy, so all employees will be paid for 40 hours of work each week. In exchange for the no layoff policy, workers agree to a wage rate of $10 per hour, regardless of the hours worked, so they don't receive overtime pay. For the next three months, the direct labor workforce will be paid for a minimum of 1500 hours per month. So now we can prepare the direct labor budget. So from the production budget, we get the units of production. And we know that for each unit, it's 0 0.05 hours of direct labor. So we're able to determine our labor hours per month and for the quarter. And we have guaranteed labor hours of 1500 based on that 40 hours work week and no layoffs. So we're just taking the difference between the labor hours required and the guaranteed labor hours. If the labor hours required exceed the guaranteed labor hours, then you're going to pay in this case, the higher amount. Um, in April, you'll see that we don't hit the 1500 hours. So we just budgeted in the 1500 because that's what's uh, guaranteed to the employees. And the same thing in June, we'll come in a little bit under the 1500 guaranteed labor hours. So that's what we budget. And may we use the actual because we're well over the 1500 guaranteed labor hours based on the units we're going to have to produce. And then of course, we know that the hourly wage, wage rate is $10. So we can compute our, easily calculate our direct labor costs for each month of the quarter and then for the entire quarter. So that's just for our direct labor. What would the total, what would be the total direct labor costs for the quarter if the company follows its no layoff policy, but pays $15 time and a half for every hour worked in excess of 1500 hours in a month. So in this case, we only had that one period where it was, I think 2,300 hours right, where it was more than 1500. So that's 800 hours at um, time and a half, which is gonna give you 57,000. Oh, they're actually, in this case, we're doing it for the full period, but yeah, it's 800, it worked out right. But you can see how once you put these things together, once you have these processes in place, it's very easy to change some variables and see how it affects your, your uh, estimates going forward. So now that we've done the direct labor budget, we can do our manufacturing overhead budget. And it provides a schedule of all the cost of production other than direct materials and direct labor. So in the case of Royal manufacturing overhead, we apply to units of product on the basis of direct labor hours. And the variable manufacturing overhead rate is $20 per direct labor hour. Our fixed manufacturing overhead is $50,000 per month and includes $20,000 of non-cash costs, which are primarily made up of depreciation of plant assets. So we're gonna prepare the manufacturing overhead budget now. So we know what our direct labor hours are because we just did that budget. It's 1300 for April, 2300 for May and 1450 for June. Our overhead variable manufacturing over rate is based on $20 per direct labor hour. So we can easily calculate our manufacturing overhead costs. And we're given our fixed manufacturing overhead costs for each month too. So total manufacturing overhead for the quarter 
is $251,000 and total labor hours are 5,050. So $49.70 per hour is what it works out to on average. Uh, note depreciation, we include our depreciation in this case. Sometimes some companies won't, a lot will. Um, and that's a non-cash charge. Always remember that uh, if you don't already. <laughs> but um, so that's why we take it out, right? Because this is just our cash disbursements now we're looking at for manufacturing overhead. And we can calculate that based on each month. And because we're giving all the information we need to do so. So it's actually pretty straightforward. Then we can move on to our finished goods inventory budget. <laughs> So direct materials, um, again, we know that that's 40 cents per pound and each unit uses five pounds of direct materials. So the cost of direct materials per unit in finished goods is gonna be $2. Our direct labor, we know that it's 0 0.05 hours per unit and the cost is $10. So there's our direct labor cost per unit in terms of finished goods. Our manufacturing overhead, we calculated that to be $49.70 per hour based on total manufacturing overhead for the quarter of 251,000 and total labor hours required for the quarter of 5,050. And we just use the direct labor, right? Cause that's how we determine manufacturing overhead. It's based on direct labor hours and we have what our cost is. So we have our unit product cost of 499. And based on that, we can determine what our finished goods inventory is based on our ending inventory of $5,000 for the production budget. So um, it's really just a matter of running things through. The selling and administrative budget. Um, the selling and administrative budget we can move on to next. And so that's going to deal with budget expenses for areas other than manufacturing. At Royal, we've determined that the selling and administrative expenses can be, or the budget can be divided into variable and fixed components. components with the variable selling and administrative expenses being 50 cents per unit sold. Fixed selling administrative expenses are 70000 per month. Uh, the fixed selling and administrative expenses include $10,000 in costs that are primarily depreciation uh, that are not cash outflows. So that's going to affect our cash budgeting. So we can prepare the company's selling and administrative budget. And we start off with April. Our budgeted sales are 20000 We know that $0.50 cents Per unit is our variable selling administrative rate. We were given our fixed selling administrative expenses of 70,000. So our total expenses are 80, but we have non-cash expenses, which are depreciation of 10. So our actual cash selling, selling and administrative expenses for April is 70,000. And for the quarter, what's it going to be? It's going to be 230,000 based on just using the same process for each of the months. From there, we could go on to our cash budget, but um, I was just thinking, yeah, we, we'll continue this one on um, Thursday. We're about halfway, a little over halfway through. So we'll start with the cash budget on Thursday.